Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Excel International Level Biology Unit 3 for October 2023. Let us begin with the first question. Question 1 says the photograph shows two human chick cells on a microscope slide. The mean diameter of human chick cells is 60 micrometer. So this is the cell. They say describe a procedure for the accurate determination of the diameter of cell A. So this is cell A and they want us to describe a method for determining the diameter. We will observe the cell using a light microscope under low power and then under high power. We also need to calibrate the eyepiece graticule with a stage micrometer. So we'll try to calibrate our eyepiece graticule by finding out how many subdivisions of the eyepiece graticule are equivalent to a specific size or specific measurement on the stage micrometer. After that, we just count the number of subdivisions that span across the whole cell, and then we can be able to calculate our diameter. So I said using the light microscope, we do that under low power to find the cell and then view under high power. We will also use the stage micrometer to calibrate the eyepiece graticule. Do this by lining up one of the divisions on the eyepiece graticule with those of the fixed stage micrometer. And then we count the number of divisions on the eyepiece graticule that correspond with a set of measurements on the stage micrometer to get the units per eyepiece graticule. These units are going to be in micrometer. Then we'll count the number of eyepiece graticule units that cross over the diameter of a single cell. And then we measure the diameter of the cell from different positions, that is to give us different orientations. This is further explaining what I explained here about the calibration process. Here they say draw cell A and label the parts of the cell, include a scale by your drawing. So in our drawing, I drew exactly this cell A here. The shape has to be the same. I included the nucleus you see here, there is a cell membrane, and then the cytoplasm. Since I couldn't see the other organelles inside, I did not bother labeling them, but the shape is exactly the same. However, in my drawing, I made it twice the size it is here. So whichever magnification I get using this, I'm going to multiply that by 2. The actual mean diameter is about 60 micrometers, which is about 60 times 10 power negative 3 millimeters. So that is the actual cell diameter. However, we also have to measure the image diameter. So I'm going to use, this is an online ruler, but when I put it across, you can see it's about 2 centimeters, which is going to be about 20 millimeters. So if that is 20 millimeters, then I'm going to say the magnification should be 20 divided by the 60 times 10 power negative 3 I already calculated. And these times 2 because my image size is twice the original one, which is here. That is twice this one. So 2 times the original times the magnification. And that would give me something roughly corresponding to the answer. And again, the value I used, which is 20, I did not choose it because I used the actual paper. I used the PDF version, and that could give you a different answer, but I'm just using this to explain how you would have answered this question. So I included the things that were required in the labeling. There is a nucleus, there is a cytoplasm, and there is a cell membrane. And when you're labeling, make sure you do not cross lines. Two lines should not cross, the image should be very clear, and do not include things that were not part of the cell. Next they say an onion cell is 0.2 millimeters in length. Calculate the ratio of the length of an onion cell to the diameter of the chick cell. So if the chick cell diameter is 60 micrometer, and then the onion cell length is about 0.2 millimeters, this is the same as 0.2 times 10 power 3 micrometer, which is 200 micrometer. So the ratio should be the ratio of this length, which is 200, divided by 60, giving me 3.33, divided by 1. And this is my ratio as I wrote it here. Or you would have said this 1 over 0.3 if 1 was your numerator, and then you divide it to create a 0.3 down here. In part B, the photograph shows part of a transverse section of a plant stem. Three types of cells are labeled X, Y, and Z. This is the transverse section they're talking about, and down here they say, identify the cell types labeled X, Y, and Z. X is the sclerenchyma. We see Y is the phloem and Z is the xylem. The next they say the photograph shows a longitudinal section of where two cells meet. So this is the longitudinal section they're talking about and they say state which of the cells labeled X, Y or Z is shown in this longitudinal section. 
when we observe this, we can see the sieve plates. We can see that, that, that. This tells us this cell is a phloem cell or is part of the phloem tissues. So my answer here was the phloem because we can see the sieve plates. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, a simple test can be used to assess the quantity of sugar in liquids such as food extracts and urine. Describe how a urine sample can be tested for glucose. Glucose is a reducing sugar and we test it using Benedict's solution. So here to the sample, we add Benedict's solution and then we put in a water bath so that we can obtain the required temperature. And then the color is gonna change. Of course, Benedict's solution is blue. So the color is gonna change from blue to green, to yellow, to orange, to red depending on the concentration of glucose in that sample. So red is going to be the highest concentration and blue is going to be no glucose present. Down here they say complete the table of results from test on standard glucose solutions. So here we have the appearance, the specific glucose concentrations as well as the glucose quantity. Uh, we know if it's blue, of course, it's zero concentration and there is no glucose at all. If it's green with no visible precipitate, there is just stress. So they went on to give us some values until here. Here they said yellow with precipitate. If there is a precipitate, then there is some glucose we can see. But if it's yellow, remember yellow is a little amount, not too much. So it's just low. And here my answer, I dependent on what was written here. Since this is until 10.0, this should be 10.1 to 15.0 because this is from 15.1. And here... After orange, we expect the highest concentration to be red, but again, it's going to be red with precipitate, so that was my answer here. Moving on. In part B, people with type 2 diabetes can have a raised blood glucose concentration. The concentration of glucose in the urine can be used to identify people with raised blood glucose levels. Blood glucose concentrations can be estimated using test strips. A study measured the urine glucose concentrations and the blood glucose concentrations of a group of people with type 2 diabetes. The table shows the results of this study. So these are the results from the experiment. We can see as the mean urine glucose concentration increases, there is also an increase in the mean blood glucose concentration, and they've given us the standard deviations from the mean. So down here they say describe how the measurements for blood glucose concentration taken in the study were processed to give the data in the table. To obtain the means, we have to carry out repeat experiments and then add them up and divide by the number of the experiments that have been carried out. And then after, we have to fit those means as well as the independent values into specific formulae to help us calculate the standard deviation. So here I said glucose concentrations were measured in repeats and the means were calculated. And then standard deviations were obtained using the calculated mean, the actual obtained values, and the number of data points in the standard deviation equation. Now here I included some equations they can use for standard deviation calculation, where this is the standard deviation, and this is going to be the summation, meaning you add up the difference between the actual value and the mean squared. So we'll find the actual values and the mean squared of everything, and then we sum it all up to get the total, and then we'll divide by n, which is going to be the number of data sets. You can use this method, and again, you did not have to state this formula. I just wrote it here for purposes of you guys learning more about how standard deviation can be obtained. Moving on. Next, they say plot a suitable graph to show the relationship between mean urine glucose concentration and mean blood glucose concentration. Plot the standard deviation for the mean blood glucose concentration at the mean urine glucose concentration of 2 AU. They want you to draw the line of best fit. The key part about drawing a graph is you have to choose an appropriate scale. So in this case, I had to use the data given to choose an appropriate vertical as well as horizontal scale. And then I had to know which one is going to be on the x-axis and which one is going to be on the y-axis. So I refer to the data, which is in this table here. This is the data in the table. And then they want me to show the standard deviation at this point. And I calculated it down here, which is what we have 55 and 395. So I plotted the independent points, which is that, 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 and that. And I drew a line of best fit through the data sets. And then I included my standard deviation at mean urine glucose concentration of 2. We can see this is the lowest, which is 55. And this is going to be the highest, which is 395. So that is how I drew my graph. Moving on. 
Next, they say comment on the conclusion that urine glucose concentration is a good indicator of that glucose level. They want you to use the information in the table and your graph to support your answer. If we go back to the graph, we can see the higher the mean urine glucose concentration, the higher the mean blood glucose concentration. There is a correlation between the two. Using mean urine glucose concentration can be a good indicator in telling us the blood glucose concentration. However, if we look at the error bars at this point or the standard deviation at this point, we can see there is going to be an overlap over all these data sets. And that means the results are not going to be significantly different. So I say a positive correlation exists between the urine glucose concentration and the blood glucose concentration. However, there is overlap in error bars, so there is no significant difference in the results. Next, they say calculate the blood glucose concentration at a urine glucose concentration of 12 AU. They say the equation for the line of best fit is y is equal to 29.3x plus 154.1. They want us to give the answer to three significant figures. So since the x-axis is corresponding to the urine glucose concentration and the y-axis is corresponding to the blood glucose concentration, I can find the value of y by substituting this as the value of x. So substituting 12 as the value of x, I said y should be 29.3 times 12 plus 154.1. And I got 505.7, but the question requires us to write the answer to three significant figures. So I rounded off and it came out as 506 AU to three significant figures, and that was my answer. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three. Mitosis and cell division are involved in growth and repair in plants and in animals. Name the stages of mitosis when chromosomes line up across the center of the cell and when chromosomes separate. Chromosomes line up at the center during metaphase and they do separate during anaphase. The next part says cell division takes place after mitosis. Compare and contrast cell division in animal and in plant cells. When asked about comparing and contrasting, we have to give the similarities as well as the differences. And my similarities are, since both cells go through mitosis, they produce two genetically identical cells, and both cells do divide, so they go through cytokinesis, meaning the division of the cytoplasm. Now, the differences are, the plant cells, of course, will remain connected because they will have pits as well as plasmodes matter. They will remain connected while animal cells are completely going to separate. Also, parts of the cell, which are the Golgi vesicles in plant cells, they form compartments which are later filled with material that is going to form the cell wall. Outside part of those compartments forms the cell membrane as the cells are not completely divided. In the animal cells, we do not have vesicles forming compartments since the cells completely divide. In part B, the hypothesis that the addition of the protein lectin stimulates mitosis in onion cells was investigated. The graph shows the results of this investigation. So from this graph, we see on the vertical axis, we have the number of cells. and the horizontal axis, we have the cells in interphase and the cells in a stage of mitosis. The key of the graph tells us this is a contra-experiment, and this is for those treated with lectin. We can see that for cells treated with lectin, there were more cells in both, either in interphase as well as in mitosis. But of course, we see a greater difference, or there is a greater percentage increase, in the cells that are in mitosis in comparison to the control. So they say state the independent variable in this investigation. The independent variable is something that is being changed and here is the concentration of lectin. So basically in the control there is zero concentration while in those treated with lectin there is quite some bit. The next question says describe a suitable and safe procedure to obtain all the data shown in the graph. Because they've said safe procedure, I have to talk about protection. The person who is carrying out this experiment has to wear gloves as well as safety goggles in order to protect themselves. Now, since this is an experiment requiring us to use plant tissues, we have to grow some of the onion roots in water and others in lectin solution. And again, this is going to be for the control and this is going to be for those that are exposed to lectin. Then the person is going to use gloves as well as goggles for safety, like I've already said, and then they will obtain the root tips wash them in distilled water. This is to remove any dirt. And then place the root tips in warm acid. The warm acid maintains the temperature. Then maceration will be carried out. 
you can use a suitable staining agent like acetylcholine or toluidine blue and then you use a microscope to visualize the cells. You will count the number of cells in interphase and the total number of cells because the difference between these two is going to be the number of cells in mitosis like I wrote here. Here we obtain the number of cells in mitosis by subtracting the number of cells in interphase from the total number of cells. So that is my safe way of describing how that could be carried out. Next part says, draw a table to show these results. Remember the results were about experiments carried out in water, maybe the contra experiment, and the experiment when the plant material was treated with lectin. So we were observing the number of cells in interface as well as the number of cells going through mitosis. These values here were got from the graph. I want to take you back. We can see this is 148 for the contra experiment, the cells in interface, and this is 160 for treated cells in interface. Here we have 24. This is for the control in mitosis. And here we have 88 for the treated cells in mitosis. So moving on. Next they say in control group cells, 14% are in mitosis. Calculate the percentage of cells in mitosis in those treated with lectin. If we go back to our table, we can see those treated with lectin, the total number of cells was 160 plus 88. So the number of cells in mitosis were 88. It means 88 over the total times 100 is going to give us the percentage. So this is what I did here. 88 divided by the total, which is 248 times 100, gave me 35.5%. And this should be 35.5, or I could say 36%. I had forgotten to write the 5, but you can see it's here. Next, comment on the conclusion that these results show that lectin does stimulate mitosis. Use the information in the graph and your answer in B4 to support your answer. If we compare the percentages, they say the number of cells in mitosis in the control group was only 14%, but here we can see it's 35.5%, which is actually 36%. We can see there is an increase in the percentage of the number of cells in mitosis when we use lectin. So that can be part of my answer here. I said the percentage of cells in mitosis is greater when treated with lectin than without lectin. However, the results do not show repeat experiments and means so there may be no significant difference in the results. And again, when they say comment, it means you have to talk about the methodology that was used, conclude about the validity of the data. In this experiment, there were no repeat experiments. Because we see from here, this is not mean number of cells, it's just number of cells. So we are not sure if the experiments were repeated. We are not sure the means were calculated. So we cannot make conclusions on the validity of the data because there is a possibility that there is no significant difference in the results. And finally, they say justify the selection of a named statistical test to be performed on this data. Here, the statistical test I would recommend is the chi squared test. And again, remember here we were trying to compare two sets of results. If you're trying to use a suitable statistical test, we need to state the null hypothesis. And in this experiment, the null hypothesis should be there is no significant difference between the observed and the expected data set. Of course, the observed is the experiment with lectin, and then the expected is the control because you do not expect there to be any difference. So the expected is going to be the control, the one with no lectin. Now, when we make a null hypothesis, we are assuming the changes that are, are being carried out in this experiment are not going to cause any change or difference in the results. Here, because we are studying the observed and the expected, the chi-square test was suitable. So my reason was because there is need to test if there is a significant difference between the observed and the expected data. I'll make another video explaining some of these statistical tests for AS biology in order to help you guys understand better. So this brings us to the end of question three, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.